Welcome to our update on the FASB's project on clarifying the scope of asset derecognition guidance and accounting for partial sales of non-financial assets. The FASB formally referred to this project as clarifying the definition of a business, phase two, due to its interdependency with their project to clarify the definition of a business, but they changed the name of the project to more closely align with the project's objectives. Today we'll take a few minutes to discuss the FASB's current status on this project and the proposed changes. My name is Casey Miles. Today I'm joined by my colleague Sam Hall. We are both senior managers in KPMG's Department of Professional Practice. The Amendments and Accounting Standards Update 2014-09, Revenue from Contracts with Customers, largely superseded subtopic 36020, which is the guidance on real estate sales, including partial sales, and it created subtopic 61020 to require that an entity generally apply the recognition and measurement principles in topic 606 to sales of non-financial assets and in-substance non-financial assets to non-customers. Stakeholders express concern that subtopic 61020 is issued does not adequately define in-substance non-financial assets and should be clarified to address how to account for partial sales and the corresponding accounting for retained interest. These two items are the focus of the FASB's project. So with that, Sam, could you take us through the decisions made to date on this project and what's going to be in the scope of subtopic 61020? Sure, Casey. The proposed changes will clarify the scope of subtopic 61020 so that entities will apply its guidance to both transfers of non-financial assets as well as any group of assets or subsidiary that includes an in-substance non-financial asset. I think it is worth noting that current GAAP real estate guidance includes a concept of in-substance real estate. However, determining if a transaction includes an in-substance non-financial asset will be a new concept. The proposal also addresses how to account for transfers in the scope of 61020 that result in the seller retaining a non-controlling interest in the transferred non-financial asset. Sam, so it's clear to me that a non-financial asset or group of non-financial assets that includes an in-substance non-financial asset would be in the scope. I'm thinking about the interplay with the definition of a business here. So some transactions that seem to be a transfer of a group or a subsidiary that includes in-substance non-financial assets, particularly those in the real estate industry, may also meet the definition of a business. Today, those disposals are accounted for in the real estate derecognition guidance in subtopic 36020 rather than topic 810 as a business. Is that still what would happen here? A transfer of anything that meets the definition of a business is excluded from the scope of 61020 as well as transactions that are in the revenue guidance, i.e. those with customers. Conveyance of mineral rights, the sale or transfer of a subsidiary that doesn't include in-substance non-financial assets, situations where you have a controlling financial interest retained, transfers under topic 805 for business combinations, and the transfer of investments, including equity method investments. So with regard to sell leaseback transactions of real estate, after the effective date of the new leasing standard, that standard will address all sell leasebacks, regardless of the nature of the leased asset. So to answer your question, if you got a business that's getting derecognized, you would be in the scope of topic 810. The same goes for situations where a controlling financial interest is retained. I mentioned before that the proposal also addresses the accounting for partial sales, those where you sell a non-financial asset and retain a non-controlling interest. Maybe you can walk us through how that wor would work, Casey. Sure, Sam. So when a non-financial asset or a group or subsidiary that includes in-substance non-financial assets is derecognized, the seller will measure the gain or loss by taking, first, the transaction price as determined by the new revenue standard, and second, the carrying amount of the liabilities assumed by the other party in the transaction, and subtracting the entire carrying amount of the non-financial asset. That retained non-controlling interest that you had mentioned is going to be part of the transaction price as determined under the new revenue standard, and entities will measure the retained non-controlling interest at fair value. This is a fairly significant change from current gap guidance on partial sales in subtopic 36020, where a retained ownership interest in a partial sale of real estate has been historically measured at carryover basis. This results in full gain on the sale versus partial gain 
under today's standards. Under the proposal, entities would derecognize a non-financial asset by looking to the guidance in Topic 606 to determine if the owner of the asset post-sale has control of the asset and if the seller retains an interest in the transferred asset, has it relinquished its controlling financial interest? As mentioned earlier, entities would measure the gain loss as the difference in the consideration that we discussed on the previous slide and the carrying amount of the non-financial asset. Sam, now that we've stepped through some of the basics of what's in scope and how measurement and derecognition happen under subtopic 61020, could you walk us through an example so that we can see how all this comes together? Sure, Casey. Let's assume that Entity A owns 100% of Entity X that holds a commercial building. In this example, the asset within Entity X is an in-substance, non-financial asset. Entity A sells 50% of their interest in Entity X to Entity B for $5 million, and it retains a 50% interest in Entity X. In this example, assume that Entity X doesn't meet the definition of a business and Entity A has determined that it no longer has a controlling financial interest in Entity X based on the guidance in Topic A10. Because Entity A no longer has a controlling financial interest, we move on to see if Entity A has relinquished control of the underlying asset NEDA looks to the guidance in Topic 606 to determine if a contract exists and if the entity has satisfied a performance obligation by transferring control of an asset to Entity X. NEDA determines that both of these conditions have been met, so now it will need to determine how to measure the gain or loss on the sale. If we assume that the carrying amount of Entity X is $7 million to Entity A, and the fair value of the entity is $10 million, then Entity A would recognize a gain of $3 million. In this example, the cash of $5 million they received for selling a 50% interest in the fair value of the retained interest of $5 million represent the total consideration of $10 million. The total consideration of $10 million less the carrying amount of $7 million gives Entity A a gain of $3 million. One other thing I want to point out here, Sam, is that under current GAAP, we only use 50% of the carrying amount of Entity X when you calculate the gain. And as everyone has seen at this point, the retained interest is being treated differently as well. So essentially, we're accounting for this as a 100% sell with the retained interest as consideration for a gain of $3 million rather than a 50% sell for a gain of $1.5 million. That's right. One of the decisions the board made was that the unit of account should be the same for all transactions and that an entity should evaluate whether it transfers control of the entire asset and not the partial interest in the entity. Ultimately, a partial sale transaction would be viewed as the transfer of an asset in exchange for a non-controlling ownership interest in another entity. Casey, do you have any idea when the proposed changes might take place? The FASB issued its proposed ASU on these changes in June 2016, and the comment deadline was in early August. It's important to note that the board will also be considering this project with the project on clarifying the definition of a business in order to make sure they have an understanding of what types of transactions could be in the scope of subtopic 61020. The board did decide that because of the interdependency that subtopic 61020 has with topic 606, the effective date of these proposed changes will be the same as the new revenue standard. Entities won't have to apply the guidance in the same manner that they apply the new revenue standard, though. For instance, if an entity applied a full retrospective approach for the new revenue standard, they could apply the guidance in subtopic 61020 using a modified retrospective approach. That's all the time we have. We hope the information we provided gives you some insight into the FASB's project on clarifying the scope of asset derecognition guidance and accounting for partial sales of non-financial assets and some of the changes that we will likely see as a result of the FASB's proposed ASU. Thanks for joining us.